Hey there, drone fans. Rick here again from Drone Valley. Today's clip is a presentation that I did a few weeks ago at the spin-up event in Austin, Texas that was put together by Kelly from Ready, Set, Drone. I've got a link below to his channel. I'd recommend you head over there and check out his clips because he does an amazing job of covering emerging technology in the RC space, including drones. And in a lot of cases, he gets products before they hit the streets so you get a chance to see them before you can actually buy them. The spin-up event was a full day of presentations and giveaways and conversations between flyers and fans of the hobby. There were a bunch of YouTube people there and I actually got a chance to be up on stage for 30 minutes talking about the future of technology. So I thought if you couldn't make the event, I would record it and put it up in the channel so you can get a flavor for exactly what goes on at these type of events. Now, the good news is Kelly's planning on doing this again next year. So if you missed it this year, keep an eye out for the Spin Up 2019 announcement on his channel. I'll make sure I cover it here. Again, it was in Austin, Texas. I assume it'll be in the same place as it was this year, but it's a great way to go and sort of understand what's going on with the hobby, get a lot of insights from people that fly a lot, get tips and tricks from people that are there. And it's just a great day of fellowship among hobbyists that share the kind of we do for flying our quads. But enough rambling from me. Let me run the uh, presentation now, and I hope you guys enjoy this. Uh, Rick Smith, where is he? So I first met Rick with Drone Valley at the DJI Spark event in Grand Central Station, what, about two years ago? Uh, <laughs> it's chaos back there. All right, kill the music. Uh, thank you. So Rick and I met at the uh, Grand Central Station DJI Spark event about a year and a half, two years ago, and I've been a fan of his channel ever since. I had seen him before that. Uh, he goes real deep on technical stuff. He is an engineer by trade, and so he knows how all the, the as Ken calls them, the who's it's and what's it's work. Um, so let's give it up for Rick. He's going to talk to us about the future of this technology. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Hey there, drone fans. How are we doing today, all right? How many nerds in the room? Get those hands up right now. All right, everybody. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Welcome to the Future because from an engineer's perspective, I say this on the channel all the time, I'm blown away by the pace of technology and the level of technology we're dealing with today. Who's this guy? Anybody old enough to remember him? Any guesses? Come on. I can't be the only one. Who is it? No, no, that's the amazing Kreskin. Come on, are you kidding me? All right, as a kid, I grew up loving this guy because he's one of those guys that can read your mind from a distance, still alive, still performing in New Jersey. I've tried to get tickets six years in a row. I can't get in to see him. This year, I'm going to go see him. But anyway, the point is, welcome to the future of the future because the pace of technology, anybody familiar with Moore's Law will tell you that things get better a little bit at a time over a long period of time. But we're in a changed uh, place right now where technology is advancing so quickly, I can't even put my head around it at this point. And drones are just a part of it. If you look across the world, there's constant disruption going on in every sector of the world out there today. So you've got companies that have been around forever in transportation, lodging. How many people remember the World Book? Maybe I'm too old. All right, so the World Book, right? I used to look forward to that every year. You'd get a new one, you'd open it up. That was our source of information. If you're a taxi cab company in New York City, you pay a million dollars a year for that medallion to stick on the front of your cab to pick people up and make money with it, they've been crushed by Uber. Poor Marriott just had to merge with two other companies because Airbnb's eating their lunch, right? And I talked to these companies professionally. They're really up against it because these disruptors in the space came out of nowhere. They didn't see them coming. Uber, or not Uber, I'm sorry, Worldbook's been clobbered by Google. Now, I hate Google for a lot of different reasons. I love them as a company, but I hate them because they take the dad factor away. I mean, years ago, before we had Alexas in the house and Google answering questions, I could sit at a dinner table and make stuff up out of whole cloth, and my kids would believe it. They didn't ask any questions. Now when I say something, they say, hold on, Dad. Alexa, is that, what the, is that the right number for the guy? And it's not. It's never right. I'm never right. It's always wrong. So I love them, but I hate them. So this is the pace of technology we're dealing with today. And if we look long term, the evolution from the birth where I came into this world back in the 1960s. I was born in 1958. All we had back then, if you were lucky enough to have a pocket calculator, TI was king of the world. They built the first portable calculator. You could use it to add stuff up. You could do basic equations on it. It was unbelievable stuff. Then we moved into mainframe. I was in college during the mainframe years, worked on a lot of IBM 360, 370, large mainframe systems where you put the punch cards through them and you had to write these complicated programs. Okay, so that was a miracle in its day. Filled up an entire room. Then we moved to the PC area, right? Everybody's got PCs at home, but in the early days, they were kind of clunky. You had the Amigas, had the uh, Apple products in the early days. In the 90s, we moved into sort of the World Wide Web. Now, one of the points I'm gonna try and make today is a lot of times when you're in the evolution of this technology, 
You get used to it. You get kind of inundated with it. And you get numb to the pace of change, right? So I want all of us today to just take a breath and appreciate how much things have changed in the last 20 years. Moving past that, we've got the World Wide Web. Now we've got cell phones, right? And I call them cell phone zombies. I spend a lot of time in New York City, and I get stuck behind these people that are doing this, you know, where there's five of them in a row, and you're behind them. Their world has been immersed now into this technology. They no longer really take a minute to breathe and look around them and enjoy all the things that are going on out in the real world as opposed to the virtual world. The next move beyond that is artificial intelligence. And I can tell you with my real job, that's the growth place. And you're going to see this, it, to some degree, it's already happening, permeating the drone environment, right? So drones today are getting smarter. They're making decisions on our behalf. So the pace of technology in those short 50 years, which is a long time, but it isn't, because I've been alive for most of it, just blows me away. And growing up through this, um, it's lost on the generation that came here. My kids are young enough where the internet's always been there. It's always been a thing that they've known. They've never known a non-internet world. So for them, that constant connectivity is there. And that drives me nuts, because I love that social interaction of talking around a dinner table and not having that phone ding or vibrate, where they've got to immediately, with Pavlovian response, grab the phone and have to answer somebody that's out in the ethernet someplace. So I love the fact that this is good, but it's important to keep perspective on that. Just to give you another metric to go by, uh, you guys remember 45s, right? When I was a kid, man, getting a 45 was just so cool because you had this visual thing, you had this physical thing in your hands, you could play the music, you could talk to your friends about it. Then we moved into 8-track tapes, right? I got a million 8-track tapes. Still, I'm in my basement. I got stacks of them. I don't know why I keep them. They're down there. I'll never use them again, but they're down there. Then we moved into cassette tapes, king of the world for a long time, CDs. Then we went to Napster. How many of you guys played with Napster? Be honest. Come on. All right. So, so Napster was kind of cool because it gave you the ability to sort of grab digital content and then use it wherever you wanted to use it, right? And people hated it, but it was an evolution that had to happen. It was a birthing process that the recording industry had to go through to get to the Spotify. Now, Spotify's king of the hill now today. I imagine most of you guys no longer buy physical media. You probably use Spotify or some streaming service to play your music. Again, all this happened in way less than 50 years. So the pace of change for me is something that I'm aware of, and we're all embroiled in it, but I want to take a breath and sort of relate this to how drones are maturing today. So moving past this, just to give you a feel, I don't know if Billy Kyle's back there, but not everything gets better with time, Billy. So this was me at 18, right? Or forgive the hair because it was the 70s, all right? But look at that buff body, which, which is still in here somewhere. It's just, it's, you know, it's cold in the Northeast, so we put a little extra weight on it this time. But, but to go from that to this in 50 years, oh my God, what happened? What the hell happened? You got to take better care of yourself, dude. What's going on? So Billy, that guy in the right's your future, man. Get ready. <laughs> Get ready, buddy. It's coming, I'm telling you. Absolutely. So we live in a world of constant disruption, and it's hard to deal with it, because it's not just the change, it's the pace of change, right? Change used to be something we get used to over time, we can take our time, sort of absorb it. Nowadays, it's every week something new's coming. Like, the pace of change, just in the drone industry alone, when you think back five years ago, when you were dealing with like a Phantom 1, where it was really basic, and if you're lucky, you strapped the camera to it. When I was a kid, I used to take uh, the first video recorder we had, and thought to myself, I wonder how many helium balloons it would take to lift this thing up in the backyard. So I tried two, it didn't go anywhere. I tried four, six, I think it was about eight, maybe eight. between eight and nine, it lifted it up enough. And then you realize the string, where's the string? Oh my God, the string, because the thing's floating off in the distance, right? So I've been involved with drones and aerial photography for a long time. This stuff blows my mind. This is, I say it on the channel all the time, it's Martian technology. It doesn't make sense that this development could take place at the pace that it's taken place. And I don't care who you fly. I mean, I get accused of being a DJI fanboy in the channel. I just love technology. It gets me up every day, gets me excited. If you've watched any of my videos, I can't sit down in front of a camera unless I believe in a technology and really find it exciting enough to share it with you guys. So I love all the companies that make this gear, and they're all kind of locked in this Game of Thrones debate over who's got the best tech and who's got the next big invention. But that constant disruption is something we have to get used to as a company. Another thing that's changed pretty dramatically in the last couple of years are these categories of technology where you used to have sort of a very clear line of delineation between consumer goods and commercial goods. It used to be pretty easy to tell a toy drone from a real drone, or at least a commercial drone like you're looking there in the Inspire 1. That's blended together. I mean, that really today, when you put a Mavic 2 up in the air or the new Evo up in the air, you're flying a commercial drone. You're flying a drone that has all the capabilities to do everything you used to have to spend $20,000 for when you load it up, right? The M210 is obviously a different animal, but but that merging of technology provides you guys the opportunity to take advantage of that to do a lot of amazing things. And I, I know I talk to a lot of the YouTubers that we're friends with, all the guys are here, but for me, it's more you guys showing up at this event that really warms my heart because it means you're involved in the industry, you're, you're excited about it, you care enough about it to learn more about it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit where that's gonna go in the future. Um, I put that up there for Ken, is he back there, Reginald Dobo? 
He left, all right, so original Dobo left. Darn it, I put that in there for him, because he's a big Evo fan. We always have the fight between DJS. So they're both good drones, they're both good drones. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the technology inside the drones, because each one of these technologies in and of itself, to me, is an amazing technology. So first thing we've got is flight. Oh my gosh, you got something that can lift off the ground in 3D space and maintain its position in space? That blew me away. 1903 was when the Wright brothers were on that beach and actually put a plane up. So to come from there to here seems like a long time, but 115 years is not that long. So okay, the thing flies, that's pretty cool. What else does it do? Well, we got LiPo batteries, right? That technology, if you don't know about it, uh, I think the gentleman's name is Goodnow. Professor Goodnow was the guy who invented the lithium polymer technology. He's 90 some years old. You guys can check me. Here we go with the Alexa stuff again, but he's 90 some years old and he's still in the labs working on the next generation of polymer drones. They're gonna be, I mean, oh, LiPos, they're gonna be glass polymers in there. We keep expecting to be 4X or 5X the length of time, but that changed everything for us because it allowed us to fly longer. We've got control topology, and that's not a small thing to control that flight with consistency in 3D space. In addition to that, I've got GPS positioning. All these technologies individually are mind-bending. You guys remember back we had nav systems years ago, right? When you bought that big Magellan thing that just stuck on your dashboard, right? It was as big as a, a, a box of tissues, and that was a dedicated device. Now you've got that in a chip inside this device. Unbelievable. Video streaming, that is a monster. You can ask the guys in the back of the room how hard it is to stream 1080p video, let alone at two miles away at 4K resolution to a monitor. That, that enough right there for me to be in love with this technology. Then going beyond that, stabilized gimbal. Again, DJI is famous for that. A lot of companies do it today. Intelligent camera, where it's making decisions around ISO and frame rates and all the wonderful things it'll do to give you the best picture. I'm not a cinematographer. I'm an engineer. I'm a nerd. But I take good pictures because the camera's smart enough to correct for the dumb things I want to do with the camera. Thank you for doing that for me. In addition to that, we've got obstacle avoidance, which is getting smarter and better over time. We've also got autonomous flight. So when you put a drone up, you've got a robot in the air. I've got a camera that's got the ability as a robot to do things that maybe I'm not ready to do as a pilot yet, to circle something. That's the first thing I tell people to learn is if you're gonna fly, first off, fly low until you get comfortable. But when you do put it up higher, learn how to circle something to maintain a point of interest without using the software. That does it automatically for you and a bunch of other cool things that are built in there. And the last thing is the digital identification. I don't wanna to get too deep into the, the conversations around the legislation, the FAA authorization bill, but that digital identification is a big deal going forward for all of us because there is, there's a Hatfield and McCoy's fight going on right now from the commercial side of the house where all the lobbyists that work for the big box companies like Amazon and FedEx and UPS that wanna use our airspace are sort of, you know, currying favors with the FAA to take over that airspace. And the only way we're gonna prevent that is to have some way to identify the drones we're flying so that people know where they are and they know who we are and where we're flying. So that's something you'll see come up. But again, for me, any one of these technologies, when you understand the bits and bytes of what makes that stuff work, just to have that on a table in a laboratory would be amazing. But to put it in a drone that I can put up in the air and fly three miles away, or at least the edge of visual line of sight, it's just mind boggling. So this hobby is interesting to me in so many ways around the technology. Um, that it gets me out of bed every morning to put these clips together. And that's what I love talking about in the channel. I mean, I, I do a lot of clips that talk about how to do things and, and how to fix things, but I'm, I'm constantly blown away by how this technology, the pace of technology change is happening. So the next thing I want to talk about is why you guys fly, because everybody has different reasons for flying. Maybe you fly for pleasure. If you fly for pleasure, is it because you want to share it with your family? I'm lucky enough that my son flies, my wife flies, I have nieces and nephews and cousins that fly. It's a family event. So for me, people get do they dive too deep into technology generally, and they get into that virtual world playing video games or whatever. And to drag my kids out of the house to take them out in a fresh, fresh air in an afternoon is a good thing. When they were younger, we did a lot of geocaching out in the woods where you're searching for those different treasures out there. And that's kind of cool because we're out in the fresh air having fun. Drones are another way to do that. So to get them out and have that family time outside flying together is a wonderful thing. It's a very bonding experience. You could be a nerd. I'm a nerd. I'm proud of that fact. It's a good thing to be a nerd today. So good on all you guys. But just the technology alone gets me excited, right? Understanding how that technology works and how I'm controlling that technology in the air. Fellowship today, today's fellowship, this kind of thing where we can sit down with people I've never met before that have commented on my channel, have sent me emails. The fact that I get emails from people all the time up to the age of 90 that are flying, 95 that are flying, or kids that are flying for the first time that watch a video we've done or you guys are gonna do, and they're inspired by that, and they thank you for helping them get up in the air and understand that. Or people that have physical disabilities that, that are kind of in a bad place, you know, they get a chance to go out, put a drone up, 
and fly out over the lake that they couldn't possibly get on. You know, I, I, I'm going to sound corny here, but that stuff tears me up when I read those things. I, know I get emotional because I'm getting older, but it's a good thing, right? So the fellowship's important to me. And then the last thing is the rescue work, right? We don't talk enough about that. We're all hobbyists. We're flying like crazy. But when you see something like the Mavic 2 Enterprise, people love to pick on it. It's not that big a change. What's the big deal with it? You put that in the hands of a rescue operator or a fire department or somebody that's out there trying to save lives, and it changes the game dramatically. It's not just a, it's not just a linear step forward. It's, it's completely nonlinear. It just it's a factor change, so it changes things by X number of factors. So rescue work's important for us. A lot of guys want to fly for profit. I'll just spend a couple minutes on that. I think we're right at the cusp of big, big things happening commercially, big things happening commercially. So, and I don't care if you do real estate photography. I mean, that's kind of a slog, but you can do it if you get in with a couple of good real estate agents. I do commercial work for real estate agents. Works out really well. Billy, you're going to have a, a really good career, and hopefully avoid the baldness down the road, but you'll have a good career making a lot of money making a lot of money in real estate, and that can expand into a lot of other things, right? So that's one way to go. YouTube's a place to be. I'm gonna encourage everybody out there that if you're not doing YouTube videos today, don't hold any of us as a threshold to getting into that business. Believe me when I tell you. I mean, the everyday dad said it before, I agree with him 100%. Talk about what you know. I guarantee you when you're flying, there's something you figured out that I don't know. And I watch a lot of YouTube videos. So if you've found something that you think is interesting, put a video together. I don't care if it's on your cell phone. I don't care if the audio's crappy. I don't care if you have flashy graphics. Take the time to put it together because you're helping the community get smarter on that. And I'll search and I'll find it and I'll use that video. So it's a very powerful thing. In addition to that, people are doing utility inspections. You got that going on. And then, of course, this, this dark cloud that's over our business right now, or our hobby right now, is this commercial enterprise space, right? These guys, I can guarantee, because I'm on a lot of the subcommittees that are talking about this, they want to own the airspace. They want that airspace to be used for commercial purposes. They want that to be a highway in the sky that they control and they protect, right? So there is going to be opportunities there for us as pilots when they start doing these autonomous deliveries. Um, so that's something else you can look into. But if you're looking to make money, I'm telling you, there's nine different ways you're going to end up being able to do something in this space down the road. So if that's what you're interested in, great. The thing I like about it is I love flying. I love flying. For me, the reason I fly is because it changes my perspective. And I, and I can't describe it any more simply. I was sitting back there before trying to figure out how I could possibly tell you why I fly. And, and really what it comes down to, and this is kind of a stupid thing to say, and it's going to be on the internet, so I'll probably regret it. But when you were kids, we all did this, right? You're sitting at the kitchen table, and you're on the chair that can rock back. And you're getting bored with the conversation at the table, and you rock back on the chair. And your parents are like, don't rock back in a chair. You're going to crack your head open. But you rock back. And that one time you rock back just a little bit too far, but you catch yourself, that split second of excitement is really what I feel when I put a drone up. I know it sounds crazy, but every time I fire up those batteries, go out in the field, put that drone up, and fly over a lake I haven't seen before, or a far someplace that I haven't been able to explore, I love it. I just get, I really get a thrill out of doing that. So that perspective for me is important. What I'll tell you there is explore and expand your horizons, because the beauty that's out there that you can't possibly see from the ground, that change in perspective, to get up 150 feet and fly over an area that you haven't been before, it just blows me away. And here's a shot I took of, uh, Barnegat Light down in Long Beach Island. I don't know if you guys know New Jersey or not, but Long Beach Island's a place that I grew up, and I spent a lot of time around Barnegat Light, going through that inlet in boats. I swam on the beach on that other side. But to put a drone up at 150 feet in the inlet, looking down at that, that light that I love so much that reminds me of my youth, just really changes my entire perspective of that view. And it's really something that, for me, and it drives my family crazy, because anytime we get in a car and drive, Dad's got a drone in the back seat. And we have to get to Florida. Dad's going to stop 27 times to shoot some videos someplace along the way because there's something cool that I have to see from above. But, but change your perspective and use the drone to do that. The last thing I'll say to you has nothing to do with technology, but it's about the hobby itself, right? Fly as much as you can. Put those drones up every day. Don't let a day go by where you don't find some time to fly because it, it's a vocation. It's a relaxing thing. Some guys play golf. Some guys cheat on their wives. They all find ways to have fun, I guess. That's a horrible thing to say. But they, there's ways to find, find excitement in the afternoon. I don't do either of those, honey, if you're watching this. But, but fly as much as you can. Well, how did I get off target on that? All right, so we'll strike that in editing. Don't worry. Also, tell everyone. Tell everyone about your flying. Because we're at a critical point right now with the public where they're not quite sure what to think about drones. It's sort of where cell phones were 25 years ago, where there's a camera in the cell phone, he's going in the bathroom, oh my gosh. So tell everybody you fly. Tell them why you fly. Tell them how exciting it is. And if you can drag them kicking and screaming out to the field with you that afternoon to fly, put the controller in their hands and show them how much fun it's going to be, because that's going to diffuse all those angry things. Because the first guy that makes a mistake 
is going to tell somebody about it, they're going to tell everybody they know about the horror story of Frank with that stupid drone. If you take them out and tell them what you can do with the drone and show them what you can do with the drone, they're going to tell everybody how much fun it was and how beautiful it was. I was out with Rick last weekend, and we took the drone down to Barnica Light. So do that. Post clips online. I don't care how bad they are. There is no such thing as a bad clip. There really isn't. So if you're doing these videos, and I'm watching your channel. I'm pointing at you right now. You're flying that Tello down there. I found your channel. I love that clip, and it's a Tello. Now, a lot of people are going to say, it's a Tello. Come on. Let's fly the Mavic 2 or some big shot drone. What you did with that drone in that clip was unbelievable, right? So wonderful. Fly the drone, post the clips. We all enjoy them. I love virtually visiting places that I'm not going to get to through the eyes of other people by flying drones. Pursue your part 107. I can't stress that enough. That, that is, even if you're not going to fly commercially, that's going to become a standard. That's going to be a breaking point between what you can do and what you can't do in the future. And I don't have a lot of details on that, but I guarantee you that that's going to be the ticket to the dance as far as being able to fly drones down the road. Maybe it's two years out. Maybe it's five years out. But that's going to be something you're going to have to do. And it's not that difficult. Ken, you passed yours. I passed mine. It's not hard to do, right? You study hard. Maybe you didn't. OK, I shouldn't have pointed to him. Billy, you got your one of <laughs> All right, Bill, that's all right. You passed it, though. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. Nobody counts on the first time you try it. It's a practice shot. Don't worry. So get your 107. Um, understand you're a pioneer, too. I know that's a brave thing to say on stage, and you're probably snickering a little bit. But when I think of the pioneers back in the day, right? Well, I wasn't around then. But when people on the East Coast said, hey, you know, there's a big country over there. Why don't we wander that way for a while? And then they got in their wagons and they left, right? And the people they left behind are like, gee, they didn't come back. I wonder if... Maybe there's bears out there or something that ate them all, you know? But, but they took that step to go to that other coast and discover all the wonder and amazement that's out there. You're at that point. This isn't commonplace today. So you're definitely a pioneer. But more importantly, seize the day. You're an ambassador for this hobby. So every chance you get to be out there and you get some angry knucklehead coming up to you telling you you can't fly here because his kids are out in the backyard or don't fly on the beach, be gentle about it, but be an ambassador for the hobby. Talk to them and tell them why you fly, why this technology is amazing, and how seductive this whole thing is for us as a, as a group. And I think it's just going to benefit everybody. And I spend a lot of time in the air, and invariably, one out of three times I fly, somebody will wander up to me and give me some grief about something. Right? Don't do it here. Don't do that. What's this all about? And I guarantee you, 100% of the time, I can turn that around just by a simple conversation, spinning the controller around, showing them what I'm doing. But seize the day, have the fun, go out there and talk to the public, and really just promote this hobby. Because, you know, again, I can't thank Kelly enough for putting this together. This was a, uh, this is a dream for me to be here among you guys. It really is, because this is a, a great community, unlike a lot of other hobbies that tend to be fractured, where there's different clusters of people that get along and others that don't. This is a really embracing hobby. I mean, there are people that are YouTube guys that are competing with each other in some respects that are all just friends. So, again, seize the day. That was pretty much I had. Uh, if you guys have questions, I'm glad to take them now, but I didn't want to take up a full 30 minutes. But uh, thank you so much for your time. So any, <laughs> any questions? Nobody? Somebody asked something, for gosh sakes. Oh, there we go. Good, good. Thank you. Thanks so much. Boy, that's a tough. You had to ask that question. So. She asked what the next big leap's going to be in drone technology. Um, I'll be honest with you. I have conversations sort of under NDA with a couple of the companies, and I, I can't say if I knew, but I don't. But I ask that question all the time. Like, for me, at this point, that Evo and that Mavic 2 are everything I need in the air. I mean, OK, maybe I'd want to add ADS to make sure I know where other planes are, maybe a little waterproofing. But you know, you can record 4K video on a one-inch sensor. I mean, I, I get great video. I've got zoom capabilities. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe changeable cameras, that type of thing. Um, I think artificial intelligence will come into it more as well, you know, for crash avoidance, certainly, and notifications of other flight in the area. Um, but short of that, I, I couldn't really predict more than that. Maybe What's that? Maybe fly there. There's the future. Oh, what a plug, man. You had to work that in there. That's good. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't talked to that guy, that's some pretty cool stuff. So any other questions? All right, great. Thanks again.